start again. Uh, I would like to welcome everybody to this meeting of Merseyside Police and Crime Panel and any members of the public present or watching the live stream at home. Uh, firstly, I'd like to particularly welcome uh, new member Councillor Leah Fraser, who is attending her first meeting of the panel since her nomination to replace Councillor Mary Jordan. Um, and you're representing Wirral. Uh, it may be helpful if we could quickly go around the room and introduce ourselves. And we'll start with the panel and then we'll come over to the PCC's team. I'll start. I'm Councillor Barbara Murray and I'm here representing the Liverpool City Council. Dave? Councillor Dave Robinson from Sefton. Uh, Keith Pickup, Deputy Chair of the panel, independent member. Councillor Billy Lake at uh, Liverpool. Can we remind everyone to use the microphones, please? Thank you. Brian Taddeo, you're independent. Councillor Leah Fraser, Worrell. Oh. Sonia Kelly, I'm a Bert Ward Councillor for Sefton Council. Paul Hewton, Sefton Council. Morning, everyone. Nick Mills. I lead on the PCC's Victim Services Commissioning team, uh, so I'm responsible for all the uh, victim services work that's detailed within the report today. Morning, uh, John Riley, Chief Finance Officer, for Police and Crime Commissioner. Morning, Emily Sparrow, Police and Crime Commissioner. Morning, everyone. Sue McTaggart, Chief Executive for the Police and Crime Commissioner. Good morning, everyone. James Lation. I'm the Head of Private Office to the Police and Crime Commissioner. Thanks, everybody. Um, Richard, have we received any apologies, please? Yes, Chair, we've received apologies from Councillor Powell, Councillor Powell Wilde, Councillor Klein, and Councillor Hodkinson. Thank you. Right, uh, if we can look at the minutes on pages 1 to 12. Uh, if you have any objections to the minutes from our last meeting held on the 1st of September 2022, can you please indicate if you wish to speak now? Thank you. I will assume, therefore, that that's a correct record of the last meeting. As there are no indications to speak, and we will, therefore, agree the minutes. Yep. Right. Has any declarations of interest been submitted? No, no declarations received, Chair. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on the, the agenda now to item 3A, which is the priority update, and it's our first substantive item today. I'm wondering if, uh, hang on, I've lost my place on my notes again. This is awful, isn't it? And they are in red. Let's start again. Our first substantive item today is the update on the Commissioner's Police and Crime Plan Priority, and this is on pages 13 to 70 in the pack. Um, Commissioner, please, could you speak to your report? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, yes, so today the focus is on the um, priority around supporting victims. Um, so, obviously, you'll be aware that um, I'm very passionate about making sure that we are doing enough to support victims. Um, and in particular, as PCC, I have um, a specific role in commissioning services um, to make sure that victims get the right support to be able to cope and recover from any crime that they might have um, experienced. Um, I appreciate there's quite a lot of information in there, um, and we did give you quite a lot just to try and give you as much detail and a flavour of what work has actually been done. Um, so included in the pack is, is the reports we've had from the um, victim services that we have previously commissioned um, and that gives you a bit of a, a sense as to how valuable their work is um, and some of the feedback from some of the um, individuals who have been supported by them. Um, we've also given you a, a broader update around the, the, the numbers that we've supported. So it was about 9,700 um, victims that we supported from 21 to 22. Um, 
And then we've also included in there some detail around the, the plans moving forward. Lots of you will be aware that I have been doing a review of my provision for victim services. Um, so there was um, some detailed information around a victim needs assessment that we did to really understand what the needs of victims on Merseyside is. Um, and then some detail in there around the, um, the future plans around the victim hub um, and also for the commissioning that we are doing. And I believe as well that you are all, are all going to be invited to the launch event that we do in November for the Victim Care Merseyside um, launch, so official launch as well. Um, and then the only thing to highlight as well is that obviously you know that tackling violence against women and girls is a particular priority. So there's some detail in there around some of the work that we've been doing in developing the strategy, um, as well as some additional funding for um, uh, particularly domestic abuse and sexual violence services. And actually in total for our victim services, we've managed to bring in over £5 million of additional funding since I've come into office, which again was a commitment I made coming into office. So um, as I say, lots of detail in there, but I'm happy to answer any questions, Jeff. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, questions for the Commissioner, please, panel? Paul. Good morning, Commissioner. Um, in Section 3.5, it mentions that there was £1.7 million pounds worth of funding from the Ministry, Ministry of Justice for 21-22. But if we go forward to Section... Bear with me a sec. 4.5. 2.9, it says that there's only 1.6 million for 22-23. So there's two questions really. Is there a reason for this drop? And secondly, um, it's 1.6 of 22 to 23, but given the current economic climate, this funding goes on to 2025. Will, will this remain static or do you think there will be an increase in the, in, in the funding going forward? So the um, yeah, so that's the very the core grant that we get given from the Ministry of Justice, um, which we have very little control over. Um, I, along with many PCCs across the country, have actively lobbied um, the Ministry of Justice to make it clear that we need more funding. The demand for our services, as you'll see in the reports, has gone up and up and up. Um, but that core grant has not um, increased, and actually we've seen a slight reduction, as you say, um, in the recent one. We have had additional funding put in, so again, there's lots of detail in the report around um, particular uplift, particularly for some of that increased vulnerability like domestic abuse and sexual violence. So we have been able to successfully bid some, for some of that and secure that additionality. So we are seeing more money coming in, which is really positive. But obviously, from a, from a practical point of view around our commissioning cycles and being able to give sustainability and longevity, that kind of constant bidding process is not a good way to fund victim services. So we are pushing back to say, actually, you know, that, that, that core grant they've given us has not changed and, and, and as you point out, has slightly reduced. Um, but we need to see that go up significantly if we're going to be able to offer the right level of service to victims. Um, Dick, do you want to add anything? Um, just to add that the Ministry of Justice made significant changes to the way that they issued funding this year. So they split the funding into the core grant, which is the funding that you're alluding to there, Councillor. But um, secondly, they, they provided additional funding through a domestic abuse and sexual violence uplift. Some of that would have come in through the core grant in the past. So actually you've got £1.6 million pounds plus the Commission has mentioned additional funding. So that's another £140,000 that's been allocated on top of that amount, which the PCC has been able to allocate out and is reflected in one of the decision papers uh, later on in the report. But, and then an additional £1.7 uh, million, pounds, which has gone out to the Domestic Abuse and Sexual Violence Services, which is uh, detailed within the additional funding table later in the report. So actually it is a significant increase in funding, yeah, yeah. but not in the core grant. Uh, and the core grant is, a, is the grant funding that uh, pays for the likes of hate crime services. Um, so that, that funding hasn't really increased in line with um, the level of victim, victims that are being, uh, coming into the service or in line with inflation. So services haven't been able to uh, reflect within their funding uh, increases in, in electricity, electricity or the costs, for instance. Um, but the PCC has been able to do that through that additional £140,000 funding. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes, Chair. Uh, 4 to 11 lists various organisations that have been uh, funded and helped towards uh, supporting victims. Um, in previous reports, uh, the numbers, I'm oh, sorry, the cash, the amount of money given to each organisation has been listed, but it isn't included this time. And there is a tremendous variation 
between the size of uh, numbers being dealt with by each organisation, one refers to nearly 3,500, one refers to around 100, so it, it, or thereabouts, so don't quote me. Uh, but um, that financial figure being missing doesn't actually help us to uh, look at, as it were, value for money in regards to the respective organisations and what they're contributing against all of the information that has been given for those, those organisations. Um, I'd be grateful if we could have that information. Um, yes, I thought it was in the pack, actually. Um, uh, if it's not there, it should be. Um, it will have gone out on all of the um, decision papers that we do. So, obviously, when we make a decision around commissioning, um, it gets publicly, it is all publicly available in our commissioning decisions, um, which I think you get emailed at the time. Um, I think, do you, do, you, do you know what page it's on? It's, I'm sure it's in there somewhere, but if not, we'll make sure you get it, because it is absolutely available, and it's on the commissioning decision. So, yeah. Yes, some of the details within the decision papers later in the pack. Um, uh, the disparity between amounts of funding that go out to victim services is really based upon the victim needs assessment evidence base that is uh, really uh, looks at a number of factors, including the volume for each service, but also the impact upon victim victimisation of individual victims being referred into the service as well. Um, so, uh, for instance, Catch-22 child exploitation contracts is one of the bigger services that the PCC uh, commits to. It's not the highest volume, but it's got an extremely high risk in terms of young people uh, being reported into the service. So the, the services all operate in a different way, and the costs therefore vary considerably across the individual organisations as well. So um, organisations like, for instance, Families Fight for Justice, who support homicide victims uh, or their brief families, um, that grant is much lower, but it's a very different organisation because it's a peer support organisation rather than the direct um, support for victims of crime. Yes, Chair. I mean, I understand what's, what's being said, uh, but I hope you'll appreciate that that omission from this report doesn't enable us to look at proper value for money uh, against the particular needs of particular services, and I understand all of that. Uh, but we do need that information to enable us to Obviously, see how it is being spent and distributed. It is, it is there actually in the key decisions in the next item. So item the decision 35 and decision 37. Um, so on the next report, it is detailed in there. Um, so it is in your pack, albeit I appreciate we've not signed it in that okay. one. So for next time, we'll make sure it's explicitly in that bit of the report as well. It might just be helpful to cross-reference things like that, uh, because there's a lot of papers for members to, to navigate. Um, I've got indications from Billy and then Dave. Really? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, uh, 4214 uh, brings us to the Catch-22 um, scheme that, that, that we have running. Um, I'm just, uh, as, a, as a member of Liverpool City Council, uh, reading through the, the very interesting detail and, and, and very interesting to read about the level of support given through this scheme, but I am as a member of that council, very surprised to find that the largest of our local authorities isn't included in the, in the Catch-22 programme. And um, I'm really, it's a simple question, I'm really wondering why, and I'm really wondering what, what efforts we've made to recruit to the scheme, the, the largest of our authorities. And... Um, I do say all of that with, with a word of caution because the figures that are given in the annual summary um, uh, uh, and indeed the final total of 9,000 uh, victims supported, I think that would be very, very much higher if, um, if Liverpool was included in, in this scheme. And so really got to ask, you know, what efforts we've made to recruit that authority and um, and why haven't why haven't we come on board and um, so just to reassure you we absolutely do go out to all the local authorities and um, a big part of the work that we try and do for my office is is efficiency through co-commissioning and so we will have lots of conversations with local authorities around what contracts we can do on a most side footprint to try and get the most for 
for, for well, most effective in terms of the funding, but also recognising that not everybody recognises the same uh, boundaries that we will. Um, so there is a huge amount of work that's being done. Um, Nick can probably talk about the specifics, but it's my understanding that Liverpool um, have their own internal approach to um, child safeguarding and, and child exploitation, and, and so they just didn't feel that they would benefit from this particular service. So we do have those conversations, but Nick, you might be able to take in more detail. Um, the child exploitation contract is quite a complex contract because it's a co-commissioned service. Um, so the additional funding that comes in from local authorities is actually additional on top of the uh, PCC's contribution, uh, which pays for uh, additional some additional child exploitation support capacity, but also um, funds uh, some work which is a statutory responsibility of the local authorities through the uh, independent return home interviews, uh, which are delivered by the service and brought into one contract. Uh, the PCC's element of the contract is a Pan Merseyside service, so it is available to Liverpool, uh, and it's been expressly um, made available since this contract was first let. Uh, I, personally, I've been out to Liverpool um, local authorities several times to, to repeat the offer. It is available and it remains available to them, should they wish to um, make use of the contract from the Pan Merseyside element. Um, so it's available, but Liverpool has its own funding strategy in terms of child exploitation. Are you happy with that response? Uh, um, yes, yes and no, really. Um, I, I, from, from my previous experience of having been a... Um, Billy, a, a, can sorry. we put your mic on, please? Cheers. Oops. Sorry, Chair. Um, thanks. From, from my previous experience, uh, 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 having been a member of the Education and Children's Services uh, Committee at Liverpool uh, City Council, a lot of the work described in, in the Catch-22 offer <coughs> dovetails very neatly with a lot of work that is going on with, uh, at Liverpool um, and a, a lot of work that has been going on to... Um, engage with young people exploited by county lines, etc. Um, and so I'm, I'm still bemused, really, why we at Liverpool haven't taken up that. I, I understand the offer's been made and we, and we haven't said, yes, I get that. Uh, but it leaves me, maybe it's a question for me to ask back home, really, um, because, uh, uh, and I think a, a question... To you, Chair, you know, why haven't we, why haven't we taken part in this? It just seems rather baffling um, that, especially as I know about the work going on at Liverpool, um, it, it just baffles me that, that we haven't engaged with this. Although, uh, once again, I repeat the word of caution, because I think your expenditure in this scheme would be much higher, because the number of people involved would be many times higher than it is now, so um, it's running well as it is. But again, it, it may be a question for, you know, for, for, for another meeting at, at Liverpool. So can, uh, just to clarify a little bit further, um, so Catch-22 is a Pan Merseyside service delivered through the PCC, and the service does operate in Liverpool as well. It's not picking up cases um, directly for direct support because that, that's Liverpool's own arrangements. Uh, but the service it has another element to it, which is around education and support um, for professionals to raise awareness of child exploitation type issues. Uh, and they have delivered training uh, and they're also working with, uh, for example, in the city centre with the likes of um, hotels, um, to look for the signs and symptoms of child exploitation. So, so that work is happening in Liverpool. It's just that the direct support is not happening there. And I think as well, just to offer you reassurance, the, um, the, the team within Liverpool in Catch-22 will still work very closely with the, what services in place in Liverpool. So they do try and have conversations and link up where appropriate to exactly do, as, as Nick says, and deliver some of that, that broader support they can offer. So although it's not delivered in the same way in, as, as it is in other local authorities, there is still a, they do work together quite closely to make sure that everyone's getting the right level of support. Thanks for that question. I think we could literally also ask that question tonight at Education and Skills yep. Select Committee, um, just so that uh, 
to raise awareness, really, and so that everybody's certain that the provision is sufficient. I'm sure it is. Um, but it's, it's as with all things, it looks like it's a gap until you really investigate it more closely. Thanks for the question, Billy. David, I think you're next. Uh, yes, thanks, Jill. That, that was actually my question. I think it's been answered. I mean, one of my concerns is obviously child exploitation um, doesn't recognise local authority boundaries. And my concerns were uh, how would this affect the whole of Merseyside if one particular authority wasn't involved? But I think that's been uh, that's been answered already. Thank you, Chair. Paul, um, I suspect that this question has already been asked, answered when we were discussing the Catch Twenty Two contract. But with regard to the perpetrator programmes. It appears that only Liverpool, Norsley and Wirral are involved. This is 5.2. Uh, Sefton and St Helens aren't involved. Is it just as simple as they didn't supply? Or is there a, a reason? And so the, there's been a number of uh, domestic abuse programmes delivered across Merseyside. St Helens is actually part of one of the DA perpetrator programmes. Um, th this... The original process was for local authorities to uh, work with the PCC to deliver um, bids, which was submitted through to the Home Office. Um, we engaged with every local authority, including Sefton, uh, to um, ask them if they wished to engage with the programme, and they weren't in the position to be able to do that at that point. Um, we are wait awaiting an announcement of further domestic abuse perpetrator funding programmes. We think that might come out this year. Um, so when it does, we'll look at the, um, the process, the prospectus, uh, and we'll uh, offer out to all local authorities again at that point. Okay, thank you. I think as well, if I can just add, going back to what I said at the beginning around the, um, the constant bid, you know, bidding process. So we work very, very closely with the local authorities to identify areas of priority and, and who wants to put a bid in for some of this funding um, in terms of what their needs are. But actually there is, a, there is a cost there in terms of demand from staff, both within my team, but also in local authorities as well. And actually we know the pressure that local authorities are under. So this is why we keep pushing back and we really welcome this additional funding. Perpetrated programmes are something we need to invest in. We need to start looking at how we can make that work. But you know, the way the current funding process is being done is very, very burden heavy in terms of the resource needed. So for some local authorities, when those bids come out and the timescales involved, they're not always in a position to be able to do that work. So we are trying to work with them, support them to try and get those bids in. But sometimes the practicalities mean it's just not possible. So hence my earlier comment about pushing back to say we'd rather you just give us the money and then we can put it out without that additional burden. Okay, thank you. Keith? Yes, Chair, the uh, Victims Hub is due to, as it were, come live um, in, uh, in November. Um, but in effect, the changeover has already happened in that sense. Uh, A, how is, is that going? And as part of that uh, development, you also refer to the victims panel, and I just wonder how that is progressing, if it is at this present time. So in relation to the Victims Hub, um, you're absolutely right. We are going to be officially launching it um, uh, properly in November, but it has already gone live and we're working through, you know, getting it embedded in and making sure it's up to scratch. Already, though, we're only three weeks in and we're already seeing a huge um, you know, response. We have um, had the numbers of victims that we are supporting is much higher. Um, some of the initial um, numbers we've got have been, we've proactively contacted 674 victims and of those, 372 have accepted support um, and they've had a victim needs assessment um, and then the right level of support has been offered. Some of that is a referral onto specialist services. Some of that is, is in-house and providing ongoing um, you know, conversation and, and things like that. So we're already seeing a huge increase in terms of the numbers of victims getting support, which is really positive. Um, we're still working through some of the, the details to make sure it's all embedded before we officially launch in um, November as well. Um, in terms of the victims panel, yes. Um, so obviously we were keen to try and get the victim hub in place. We are now looking at um, a, a role description and, and looking at what that role might look like um, in terms of who we would get to sit on that panel. Um, so hopefully we'll be looking to launch that or start to advertise for that in the next couple of months, I think. Can they just follow that up, sorry, Chair? Has the force been able to identify appropriate officers and, sta and or staff to support the development of the Victims Hub 
uh, as a separate sort of operation rather than integral to other bits they're doing. Yes, yeah, so absolutely. Um, it's being um, treated very much as its own kind of independent unit um, sitting within Merseyside Police. Um, the majority of the staff have actually come from victim sport, so we brought the same staff over to sit in this local unit. Um, so the staff will be the same as, as what we're doing the work previously, which is brilliant because they've got all of that expertise and that knowledge. Um, so yes, yeah, so that work's all, all done and, and they're working really well as a team, which is great. Thanks, Keith. Could I just ask on that item, um, who is actually being consulted and which dedicated subgroups will be charged with the delivery? Thank you. Sorry, it, it consulted around the um, Bands Against Women and Girls Hub. Have I got that wrong? Oh, the delivery plan. Sorry, I'm on the wrong page. Um, any other questions from the panel? I do have a couple of questions I want to ask. No? Okay. Um, previously, we were discussing um, this, and one issue has come out, Commissioner, that we are interested to know a bit more around, and it's the difference between awarding grants and actual awarding of contracts, because we know contracts are very specific and the outcomes are very specific. Whereas when we're awarding grants to different organisations, they keep their records in different ways, and we just wanted some reassurance around knowing that we are getting the delivery of what we're paying for. Thank you. Grants tend to be given to, for smaller amounts to smaller organisations and behind that there is a, a grant agreement with terms and conditions that everyone signs up to in terms of monitoring and, and de key deliverables in that, that, that agreement. And Nick's team monitor the outcomes and I monitor the finance side of it. In terms of the, the contracts, they're, they're for much higher values and they're subject to um, the Commissioner's financial regulations and therefore we have to go to tender for those. Uh, there'll be a, a, an open tender. Uh, and, and then basically we'll award the contract and agree the deliverables in that. And again, the contract management side of it is done by Nick and his team during the course of the year with the provider. On the finance side, I'll report to the Commissioner. That's how it basically works. Thanks for that, John. Just a little further on that, is there any comparison done in terms of the value we're getting? Because even small amounts of money we can put a value on it, can't we, and um, compare it with those larger spends. Do you know what I mean? Do we ever look at it that way? Yes, we do. So uh, for all of the uh, victim services contracts, that they, all the services that are reported to within the report that you've got here today, that they're all, they're all contract-based, so they're very much um, based around uh, contracted requirements. Um, requirements of the Ministry of Justice Victim Services grants, but also we, we put in place monitoring arrangements throughout the year for those services to report data back to us at specific points of the year so that we can evaluate the services that they've provided. The, the other smaller grants that John's alluding to that may go out through the likes of the Youth Diversion Fund, um, they're slightly different because we have to rely upon the organisations to be able to um, tell us what they're going to deliver for the funding. It's slightly the other way around, but, it, but even in those cases, all of those um, initiatives are all evaluated one way or another. So, uh, for instance, the Community Foundation for Liverpool, uh, sorry, for Lancashire and Merseyside, evaluate a lot of the smaller programmes on our behalf. Sorry, on the PCC's behalf. And I suppose another question around that is, do these small amounts of grants, are they value for money? or to turn it on its head, if they are very good value for money, are the contracts value for money, it's, it, are we getting a parity across both of those types of spend? I think in terms of contracts, because we've gone up to open tender process, that helps us demonstrate that there's some value for money there, and hopefully that in terms of delivering and supporting the victims, that's how we also evaluate that. Um, in terms of grants, often there's a, a bidding round, and, and it is about the area, the, the, the type of um, victims they are supporting, and also the numbers that they can 
support really. So you're at that evaluation stage, that's where you're comparing really. And then you, you award the grant on, on the expectation that they would deliver against what they uh, agreed to. So that's how we demonstrate value for money there, if they achieve those deliverables. Thanks for that, John and Nick. Um, I think that's one we'll probably revisit because um, we, what we want to be able to reassure ourselves about is that we're getting the same value from the pound unit cost, whichever channel we go down, because there is this quite wide variety of delivery uh, mechanisms. That's what we're thinking. Um, okay, just from myself again, looking at the appendi appendices further down, and it, it, it's true in most of them, really. Um, we just wondered how much data is actually sitting behind some of the information we're receiving. Uh, so, for example, on page 34, the Raza Razak report summary suggests 33% increase in referrals, but we're not sure what that related to. Um, the restorative justice, 168 referrals, was an increase. Um, and on page 30, the catch-22 um, refers to 49 new referrals. And also further, we would wonder if there is some context in terms of when people refer to under-reporting, where we may be getting some intelligence about what numbers really are like and how much success we are having with referrals in any of our schemes. So it's just really about what kind of data is sitting behind some of the numbers reported, please. Um, so I suppose we do a lot of looking at data across the board. So there's a lot of detail that we will gather from our commission services, which is all kind of outlined there, so you can get a sense of what referrals they're getting. Um, you've also um, had site the victim needs assessment, which looks at that broader picture um, and tries to look at, you know, what has been reported to the police, for example. We know that not everybody will want to report to the police and they might just go to a direct commission service. So there might be a disconnect between that data, which we'll always look at. Um, and then there'll be national data recording as well. The crime survey will look at particular crime types and, and identify whether people might have experienced something but don't then report it to either the police or go to a service. Um, and then there's other surveys that I will do. Um, the survey I did last summer about women's experiences, for example, in, in safety around the city centre. So we're constantly collecting data to try and add to this kind of rich picture of, of what the demand is for, for services, what the victim experience is. Um, and we kind of constantly look and see if we need to gather more to try and make sure that we've got the information we need when we're making decisions, for example, around commissioning victim services. Does that answer your question? Yes, uh, but by the same token, we do know that often policing in particular takes place where there is reported, whereas if it's underreported, it can be overlooked. So I just think that's something we're just aware of. Um, and I think it, the explanation of what you said then is actually necessary for us to give it out in a more public place if you like and it is worth saying that um with these um with all the services that we provide you know the whether they report to the police or not is is completely not a requirement so we're very conscious that we're very focused on looking at what is the need out in the community and that's what we try and focus on providing support for um, and we understand that the police data will only be one part of that bigger picture so absolutely we take that into account thank you commissioner um i don't think there are any further questions on this oh sorry leah Sorry. Oh, yeah. Am I all right now? Okay. Sorry, sorry about that. I, this is a new system for me. Um, I've just got a further question um, on the page 56 of Appendix 1, Restorative Justice. Um, 168 referrals, new referrals to the service in 21-22 says it's an, uh, an inc a considerable increase upon the previous year. What was the previous year? And, and what is sort of the average each year. Do you have that figured hand? Sorry, don't have that uh, direct data to hand, but the uh, previous year was severely affected by COVID. So the, the service um, that is delivered by the PCC for restorative justice is a, a post-conviction service. So restorative justice can come in many ways, but this is very much focused upon adult 
post-conviction cases. Uh, and one of the difficulties that the service had during the year was to be able to get into prisons, to be able to speak to offenders uh, because of the restrictions upon them. So that the numbers being referred in through offender managers within the prison was very low because they knew that the service couldn't, be, couldn't respond. So that, that caused real difficulties to the um, service, which responded really well or as well as it could do by uh, communicating in different ways with the offender. But the uh, RJ process has to be really controlled, uh, support the victim, but also make sure that the victim is safe so that to be able to respond properly, the, the service really has to have that face-to-face -face contact with both victim and offender. I think as well, the um, restorative justice approach is still quite new. Um, and I think there's still got a bit of development to do in terms of... Um, uh, victims seeing it as an option for them and being aware that it's something they could access that might give them some closure potentially um, or indeed from an offender point of view what benefits they might get from engaging in it so I think it's something we're keen to look at how we can develop and, and move it forward because as I say it's still a bit of a growing area I think Thank you everyone uh, As there are no further indications to speak on this topic um, can we record that the action has been endorsed please? Um, and we'll move on to item 3B. Our second item is the medium-term financial strategy, Commissioner. Could you please take us through the report? Thank you. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. So just very briefly, and then I'll hand over um, to John. Uh, I appreciate that there is quite a lot of technical information in this. Um, so we have tried to make it as accessible as possible. But obviously, please do ask if anything is not clear. Um, this basically gives you an update in terms of um, how we are approaching um, our funding strategy and um, making sure that we are taking into account some of the challenges that we've got coming down the line and indeed some of the um, challenges that we've already had to grapple with in terms of things like um, the increase in pay um, and increased inflation and what that does to the budget um, and how we manage that. Um, but I think John's going to take you through it in a bit more detail. Thank you. Every year we, we set an annual budget, which has got to be balanced. And also at that same time, we also produce a medium-term financial strategy, which looks at the ne up to next five years in terms of what our potential expenditure plans are, what our income we expect to get, and then gives us an overall view whether there's a savings requirement or there's some surplus resources there that we can use. And also then we can feed in, in terms of our, our reserve strategy uh, as well. I think... On table, in table one on page 74 of the report is a summary of the, the MTFS, which is, I'd say is five years, and it includes the first year there, which is 22-23, which this is current year budget. So just before, this was all done in February when we set the last budget. I think it's important to, that this is the context. The goalposts have moved completely since, since then. We'll, we'll come on to that shortly. But at 22-23, we set a balanced budget there, you, you can see. And, and basically, how we, how we did that in the end, we, the Commissioner had to use £2.2 .2 million pounds worth of reserves. But before we got to that situation, there were a couple of things that were, were delivered. The Chief Council made £3 million pounds worth of savings in a year. Uh, we increased the precept by the £10, pound, which is the maximum of the referendum threshold, which is equivalent to 4.4%, and gave us an extra £3.8 million. Pound. And as I say, we, we utilise reserve there. But we did assume at that point that pay inflation would be 3%. And we also assumed that inflation would be 4%. Now, we know um, in terms of inflation, we didn't announce them yesterday, but it's now 10%. So it's significantly moved since the time we prepared this. Uh, and, that, and also in terms of pay, the pay award for this year was actually equivalent to 5% across the board for both police officers and police staff. So in year, there is a financial pressure bridging that gap for the additional pay award, but also inflation. Now, the way we're doing that at the moment is there is actually an underspend on the, on the budget. So we hope to address the in-year pressures um, through the underspend and, and maybe some reserves. But what that does in terms, certainly the pay award, that additional 2%, though we can address it as a one-off in, 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 in this year, moves the increase, it's a reoccurring increase into next year. So that will significantly have an impact on this position uh, going forward. In terms of the remaining um, four years overall, what, what that table shows is um, there's a cumulative savings requirement of £13.7 million required to, to, to balance the budget over the period. Now, what the Commissioner, in agreement with the Chief Council, has agreed is that we'll use some reserves to basically 
push the savings requirement to, towards the years four and five, give the force an opportunity to um, implement the police uplift program, some of the changes that they need to do to, to, to get themselves on a more stable footing, knowing full well that there is this big savings requirement coming down the line. If the government continue with the, um, the police operation, uh, police uplift program where you can't reduce police officer numbers, then that puts real pressure on police staff in terms of savings and decivilisation. But we're hoping to, by pushing it down the line a bit, it gives a bit of time to consider and maybe some of the underlying assumptions that underpin this will change. If I can touch on those underlying assumptions, last year the government announced a three-year multi-year settlement, okay, which covered 22, 23, 23, 24, 24, 25. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I would have said they were fairly committed to that. But obviously, um, since the mini-budget and a new chancellor coming in, basically, government departments have been asked to look at their, their department spend and look for savings so that they that may reopen. Hopefully it doesn't, but if it does, it can only be one thing, a reduction in home office budgets, which will be get passed on potentially to, to commissioners uh, and forces down the line. But we wait to see through the uh, mid-term plan that will be announced on Halloween, uh, if not, be, not before by the government, what implications there are there. In terms of pay, um, I say we assume 3% in this year, but it's actually equivalent to 5%. We are assuming an increase of 2.5%, 2.5% followed by 2%. Again, there's annual pay review bodies um, which will determine that. Though the government in the past, as you'll be aware, have set public sector pay freezes, that may come back on the table going forward, or as we know, the cost of living is putting pressure on um, employees and they are demanding greater pay rises. So that, that assumption, again, uh, could change going, going forward. In terms of inflation, we assume from 23-24 that the Bank of England will get inflation back under control at their 2% level. Clearly, they now recognise that that won't be possible for at least 18 months, maybe two years. Um, so we'll have to adjust that, pay us, uh, that inflation assumption there. In terms of the precept, the assumption is that uh, last year the government said that, that they would allow the commissioners to, to increase their precept by £10 per annum for, for, for the next three years, which is what we've assumed that the commissioner will do that. Um, but I'll, that is, again, subject to confirmation of the referendum principles in, in December to see whether the government will stick with that £10 increase. They could reduce it, they could increase it, we just don't, don't know. But the strategy has always been for the Commission to maximise that, that precept. And even doing that, you can see from the tables that there are budget deficits in year, and the Commissioner is, is using reserves to push that savings requirement down the line. You'll know use of reserves, it's, it's one-off. You know, it, it doesn't really... It, it takes pressure off in the short term, but long, medium to long term, it brings the pressure back on. So overall, there's a really challenging situation in February, but that situation has and will change going forward, and it's likely to deteriorate, if I'm being honest. Um, we are now into the budget process. Um, there are a couple of key government announcements that we're looking at or waiting for. The first one is this mid-term financial plan on Halloween by the government, which will set government departments positions, not necessarily PCCs, though there may be some guidance around the public sector pay um, and also referendum levels. We, we just wait and see that. The next big thing then is the actual settlement in December, which will tell each force commissioner what they are going to get in terms of grants, and hopefully they'll be in line with what we were told last year. Um, if, if not, obviously, then we have to re review that. Um, commissioner obviously it's going to consult on the precept, which will be done in January before it comes back to yourselves in February for, for consideration. Uh, and you have the opportunity to either support that or veto that. Uh, and if, obviously if you veto that, the Commission will come back with a, 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 a reduced precept, which you again can consider uh, before the Commissioner finally sets the precept. Um, so all I can say is we're, we're, we're starting the budget process. 
It's going to be quite challenging. There's a lot of uncertainties compared to last year, uh, and we wait some direction from uh, the government. Um, we, we wait for the Office of Budget Responsibilities report on the fiscal on the, the standing of the economy, uh, what they see is where inflation will go, with regard to uh, council tax receipts also, and also the Bank of England in terms of what they're doing with their monetary policy in terms of um, interest rates, because that does affect us, because we have got an estate strategy, quite an active capital programme, which is funded from borrowing, which, if, you know, it, which is based on last year's rates, which have clearly moved uh, in the wrong direction for us. Uh, since we did this report. Um, so, I mean, this will get updated as part of the budget report uh, and we'll report it back to you then. Thank you, John. Okay. Brian, I notice you've yeah, got a thanks. question. Can I just go first, please? I yes. just want to ask a very simple question. Um, when we talk about using reserves, John, um, would income that is raised via selling off parts of the estate become reserves? That becomes a capital receipt, and that is applied to capital expenditure. So it'd, it'd be offset against a, a, any borrowing we need to do initially. So, for example, when we sell Smith Down Lane, that will generate a capital receipt, but it will, it will go against the capital pro next year's capital program. So, therefore, we don't need to borrow as much as what we planned. The issue with the capital receipt is actually getting to a position where we can sell the building. There's often a time delay there that we're facing at the moment. Brian? Yeah. Thanks, John. That was a, that was a good summary and <clears throat> should be quite a challenging time for you, I would imagine. Um, looking at the, a couple of questions, really. Looking at the um, cumulative budget going forward, I mean, is there any contingencies you're going to look at now to do things differently rather than put the, um, the onus on the public to pay that, that 13.7 million? <clears throat> the, the Chief Constable has a, a community first uh, board which is reviewing every bit of the service and has done over the last couple of years. And you'll see there is a paper on there which updates you on where, where, where they're up to on that. Um, there's a number of views going on. The actual MTFS, you can see on table one, mm -hmm. that's £13.7 million. Pound, the Chief is well aware of that. And there are plans to deliver that if need be and can be brought forward if, if need be. But there is... A savings target there of 600,000 followed by 1.2 and those plans will be delivered so that the chief is making savings and also within the MTFS already we have we've accounted for a fair of three million pounds worth of savings that we know are, are filtering their way through right. as we see so savings is very much part of this um, and, and part of the, the solution to balancing the budget Okay. Um, just to add as well, so in terms of obviously when we look at the income for Merseyside Police around the Home Office grant um, as the bulk and then obviously the council tax precept, um, we are very conscious as, as PCCs, we've had a number of conversations about the pressures that we know people are under um, while we're, and we're very mindful of that. So we are writing, uh, we were going to write to the previous Home Secretary but it'll be a new one now, um, but whoever is Home Secretary will be writing to them to say you need to be mindful of this and, and you know we've said publicly many times that we have concerns around the council tax precept and the burden it puts on poorer uh, residents like those that we have across Merseyside so we are going to be raising that as well in terms of we'd like you to give us some additional funding so that we don't have to necessarily increase the council tax precept there's no guarantee we'll get anything and that puts us back in that difficult position but we are going to challenge that as well. That, that was my second point really. <clears throat> I think it's assumed that the precept will be at the maximum like it has been for previous years I mean People can't afford it. They couldn't the previous years, and this year it's even 10% inflation at the moment. They can't afford it. Yeah. So, I mean, ask you to look at it again. And this is a personal view, not being a councillor. Um, it's going to be difficult for a lot of people. No, absolutely. And I'm very, very mindful of that. Absolutely. Um, the pressure that people are under with everything that's going on. Um, I suppose the challenge that we will face is if we don't see any additional income and, you know, worst case, if we then start to see more savings coming down the line, given what the new Chancellor is, is talking about. Um, if we don't do the precept, then we will be in a position where we will be making more savings. And it just means you will have less staff, less PCSOs potentially less officers, depending on, on what they do with uplift. And that is a very difficult position because we want to be able to, the chief wants to be able to deliver the best service Merseyside. And that's the challenge we've got. So, uh, you know, obviously we're weighing up all the options to try and see where we get to and we'll keep putting pressure on. But I don't disagree. It's going to be a very difficult um, decision. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, there's one item on the first page of the uh, Appendix 1, which relates to the requirement budget for 200 officers. I know this is the, uh, as it were, the remainder of what was uh, started before, as it were, the, the, the extra officers that were there. But does that become one of the specific areas that, in fact, may well be held up due to budget requirements? In terms of uplift, that is, that all those officers have been recruited. Okay. Um, what's shown in, in, in the MTFS, MTFS is, sorry, is you may recruit 200 in, in year one, but there's still a financial implication going forward as, as a, the full year effect, incremental growth, and pay, paying price as well on, on those, and that's what you, is reflected in there. But all the uplift officers that have been recruited uh, up to, up, as now, I think Mayside is one of the few forces that actually achieved their targets, to be honest. Thank you. I thought that was the case, but yeah. And obviously, currently, that funding is, is all ring-fenced for officers, so any savings we have to make will be outside of that funding because that is ring-fenced funding that we have to spend on officers. Thank you. Are there any other questions on this item? No. Uh, as there are no indications to speak, um, it will be recorded this action has been endorsed. And we'll move on to item 3C, um, which is the Police and Crime Commissioner's decisions. Commissioner, could you take us through the report, please? Um, yes, thank you, Chair. So I think we've already touched on a couple of them. As I say, there's um, two decisions there in relation to the awarding of victims' um, services contracts. Um, and then there's uh, also a key decision around annual treasury management performance but I'm very happy to take any questions. You'll be pleased to hear there aren't any. So that one's quite straightforward. Um, can we move on to item 3D? Um, and it's the performance dashboard, which is something we specifically asked to have a look at um, at the last meeting, and we'd like to thank everybody for putting that together and presenting it. Um, do we have any questions, panel? Brian? Yeah. First of all, thank you. <laughs> it's a great piece of work. Good. I mean, super. A couple of little comments. Okay. Um, the difference between ongoing and in progress is one, and the, the difference in colours. The, there's no end date on any of the tasks now, I'm not sure why that is. And are you, are you struggling to, um, are you up to date with where, where you think you should be? Like, is there any amber items in there that, that aren't there at the moment for something that you don't think you'd be able to close out in a, in a timely mash, uh, fashion? Yes, thanks, Mr. Tadeo. There is very little difference, isn't there, between the ongoing and the in progress, but we just wanted to highlight that some of these we can't really put an end date on because obviously it's for the life of the uh, of, of the plan uh, that the commissioner has has um, you know signed up to and, uh, and uh, bearing in mind that that's just the feedback from the community. However, uh, some of these issues that we, we need to keep on, you know, whether it's lobbying or whether it's uh, in terms of the progress that uh, we're doing with regards to scrutiny of the force as well. Yeah. Um, and this is, a, this is a work in progress. So there will be more of these where there's a couple where we've actually put, we, we have completed them because That's obviously right, yeah. they're, they're quite clear cut. Uh, the rest, you know, about even about picking some out there, about listening to the evidence and the voice of the victims. The commissioner will be having regular focus groups and forums in respect of that. So we just feel well, that it has been started, it's in progress, but it's not something that we want to put a, a, an end date on. The end date really for the plan is uh, when the plan expires, which was 2024, 20, yeah, yeah. Right. The, the end of the commissioner's term. Well, However, I, th I thought that might be the time, yeah, actually, to yeah. be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. And I think as, probably, as well, obviously, I do an annual report every year um, to reflect on what progress I've made on some of these. So we'll be doing another one this year and the year after um, in terms of the lead up to um, the next election. And then obviously, depending on what happens then, you know, so we'll be reporting regularly in terms of what progress we've made each year. Um, and then it'll obviously be refreshed in terms of whether it's myself or a new commissioner at that point, And the same process will apply. That, that was another question. But yeah. I thank you for that. <laughs> and, and I mean, sorry. So I was just going to add to that as well. As you know, as well, it's only a snapshot this because you'll get the 
yeah. more detailed report yeah. through the pillar reports. But again, I know that um, you're quite keen to have just that um, yeah. update generally on the other pillars that we weren't necessarily bringing at the time. So, so you plan to publish this like every year? Or, or so this, this won't necessarily be published, but I do an annual report. Um, so this is this is for internal monitoring, and obviously for yourselves, so you can see the progress that we're making against each of the pledges. But the annual report that I'm required to do every year will probably pull out some of the detail in terms of what we've achieved in that year and um, that's contributing to this that's being delivered by this plan. Okay. No, that's very good. Thank you. Once again, thanks a lot. Keith? Um, on this occasion, it's not a pointed question. Um, but a number of uh, times in the dashboard scrutiny mission, meetings I mentioned, I wanted to make the panel aware that uh, I attended the last scrutiny uh, meeting the Commissioner had with the Chief Constable and her senior officers, um, and I would encourage other panel members to take advantage of the Commissioner's invitation to attend, because the meeting for me was not only informative, it was actually pleasant to sit and listen to officers being open and honest and informative, um, backed up by the Chief Constable, who clearly demonstrated confidence in her officers. And I have to say that the Commissioner and the Chief Executive both also challenged appropriately at the time. Uh, so it is one of those things which the Commissioner has previously said would be happening and uh, has managed to get the Chief Constable to attend, which didn't happen previously. Uh, so I think that's a positive development in terms of the scrutiny which the Commissioner has previously said was happening. I've seen it in action and I would encourage other members to do the same. The next one I think is the 1st of December, if I'm right, somewhere around there. Yeah. I always check it out, but I think it's worth the panel noting that uh, what, I, what I would see as positive scrutiny meetings are actually taking place with the Chief Constable and the Senior Officers. Um, just to say as well, we do obviously live stream them usually. I think we couldn't on that occasion because of uh, a room issue, but um, we usually live stream as well. So if you want to watch it online, you can do that at your leisure. That's great. High praise indeed from Mr. Pickup. Um, just coming back to the dashboard, one of the thoughts I had was, although end dates might not be applicable, I think it's um, helpful to have what we call milestones um, to, to support monitoring of the lines, because if the end date is a few years away, we need to know when we're on track or if we're deviating. So I just think milestones might be a good column in here as well, and how we're going to measure those sort of things. Any other questions on this item? Right, Jeff. I think we're now on item 3E, and it's on pages 109 to 114 in the pack. And could we ask the Commissioner to take us through the Community First programme update, please? Um, thank you, Chair. So, uh, as John alluded to earlier, this is um, part of the process by which the um, uh, police look at how they can make savings um, and how they can make sure they're working very efficiently and effectively. Um, so I suppose it's not really uh, for you to kind of approve the details of decisions that have been made, but I suppose it's just to give you some reassurance around the process that happens um, and also particularly where um, that work is being done, but also my role in that. So I am able to, as the Commissioner, have sight of some of those decisions um, in terms of uh, how they develop a business case uh, for a particular investment or, or a saving um, and what the outcome is going to be. So it's just to give you some reassurance really about that process that's in place to deliver that. Thanks, Commissioner. Any questions on this item? Okay. Uh, Leah? Thank um, you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, just um, the acronyms uh, OHU and RASO in the report. Uh, yes, sorry. Uh, they, the, the police like the acronyms. Mm -hmm. um, OHU is Occupational Health Unit, and RASO is um, Rape and Serious Sexual Offence or Offences. Okay. Thank you. Item 3F, estate strategy update. Do I have... Are you speaking to this commissioner? Can you? Yes, thank you. Um, yes, so this is just the update in terms of where we are up to with the um, estate strategy. Obviously, um, the previous estate strategy is still in place and I uh, made a commitment to review that. Um, there is still a lot of ongoing work 
um, around things like the um, uplift and the increasing numbers of office, officers that we've got now. Um, there's a community first review that the um, police are doing internally. We're also looking at things like agile working and what that means around whether people are working more flexibly now. Um, and we've also obviously got a number of the um, financial challenges that John alluded to that are going to be coming down the line. So we're very mindful of all of those different um, areas of focus uh, in terms of what we're looking at for the estate strategy. Um, so in detail in terms of the report is, is, is where we are up to, I suppose. There are a number of disposals that were outlined in the previous estate strategy that are moving ahead, as well as some of the um, continuing refurbishment. So, for example, say Anne Street um, Police Station, that is progressing very well. Um, and there's a few other bits of detail in there around some of the minor refurbishments that we are doing to some of the properties. Um, but uh, other than that, I'm happy to take any questions, I think. And then Paul. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm aware that uh, in respect to Garston Police Station, I think I remember last time the sale was better than we'd originally anticipated. But uh, apart from that, I'm just wondering why it's taking so long to get a regular contact. We talked about the, using the health centre, and, and now there are periodically um, surgery type sessions available through there. But why is it taking so long to actually provide for the people of Galston a regular uh, contact point? So this is for the community police station in the in the health centre. Yeah. So um, unfortunately, it's it, it's been out of our hands because we've been working um, with the NHS, um, and so we had a site that was identified. And there was a lot of work done, but I think the NHS then came back and said that wasn't going to work for them anymore. So they have offered us another site, which I think in some ways is much better in terms of that, that visibility. But unfortunately, we are stuck in terms of um, how quickly the NHS will move to be able to get that site ready for us and in a position where we can start using it. And um, just to reassure you, though, there has been a lot of work being done in that area, despite like that because we're very conscious that people still want to see that visibility and um, so as you say there have been um, local policing teams going in and doing surgeries there as they have been doing around um, the wider area as well um, and in addition to the usual activity so we are very mindful that there is still a need for that visibility um, but to a certain extent our hands are tied in terms of how quickly we can get the NHS to get the buildings ready for us. I'm oh, sorry. Go on. Sorry just going to add to that um, just to pick up on page 141 as well, is that there's quite a detailed outline with regards to uh, Garston Police Station in terms of uh, the local policing team's interaction as well, just for a bit of reassurance for the community. Um, I think it's also just important to, to flag up as well, unfortunately, um, because of, uh, I assume, because of the economy at the moment, uh, Garston Police Station um, was up for sale and we had accepted um, that, that sale. Unfortunately, the, uh, the buyers have now pulled out, so we're now having to, to re-advertise that as well. But it's just to bring to everybody's attention that obviously that's going to reappear again in our papers. Yeah. Paul? So it's a similar question really following on from Keith, but this time it's concerning Ernsdale and Paso Heath. I was just wondering uh, when you are disposed of, is there any interest already in the sites uh, and is there anything in place uh, to help uh, the community that are going to be uh, impacted by these losses? I think on those who are still going through the process really, um, though we are due an update fairly soon, it should be in time for the next meeting if that's okay. Okay, it's too early to ask then, yeah, okay, thanks. Thanks. John, could I just ask um, what the other options are for the Granby Police Station, please? To be honest, I think they're still being explored, to be honest. I don't yeah. go any further than that, to be honest. Um, they are looking at every opportunity for that site, if, if not necessarily saying there, but also around the area. But I don't think it have come to a, a decision yet, but it, I should be aware to be one of those long-term um, issues for, for us with, with no obvious solution in sight, unfortunately. Are there any other questions on this item? No? Thank you. So, therefore, we will move on to item 3G, which is your update, Commissioner. Thank you. So, yes, this um, uh, update gives you some detail around the recruitment of uh, Deputy Police and Crime Commissioner 
Um, we've obviously previously discussed um, the need for a deputy in terms of the capacity and, and what um, there is to do in this role. Um, and so this just gives you the process in terms of the outline. It's obviously live now at the minute. We're accepting applications. Um, and there is a process for um, you as panel members. I think we've agreed that somebody could observe, as has been happened previously, to observe the interviews. Um, and, um, and obviously then there'll be a confirmation hearing as well for yourselves, which we are planning to do in line with your next meeting in December. And um, so I hope that worked timing wise, but yes, that's the process. So happy to take any questions on it. Brian? Yeah. Um, what, what, what's responsibilities of the role? Is that, uh, based, is that based on your previous um, position as deputy? Um, so the, there is a role description, which I think we've included in there, um, and, a, and a JDQ and various other things that gives you a bit of an idea. Um, it's probably going to be slightly different to what I did as a, as a deputy. Um, it's very much meant to try and um, support me to... I'm just finding that I can't be in two places at once, for example. So it's, it's trying to make sure there's somebody who can um, make decisions when I can't be there or can support me to be represented at events uh, and engagements with the community where I can't be there. But you'll see in the, um, the role description, there's a lot, there's various... Um, Criteria, it's various things we'd be asking them to do, and um, so it's all outlined in in the job description. Yeah, I, I did read that, but I'm okay. was quite surprised that was a part time role as well. And that was um, and to do that sort of position, have that position, and do the role. I mean, it seems full time to me. Well, I think um, I'm very mindful of the budget um, and trying to make sure that we manage that within the the, the scope of the budget for my office. Um, I mean, it varies. Some deputies have been part-time. Um, I suppose we're going to get them in place and then we have the opportunity to review that if we find there is more demand and we want them to come in and do it um, full-time. But uh, in previous experience, I've felt that um, uh, three days a week or part-time has been sufficient to cover what needs to be done. Um, but we'll keep it under review, depending on how it goes. In that role, will it have any direct um, people reporting to it? No, no, they won't have anybody reporting to it. Um, they will very much be uh, um, supporting, supporting me. Supporting yeah. Okay, thanks. Keith? Um, the job description, if I can compare it uh, to your previous experience as deputy, is vaguer in the sense that uh, I think prior to appointment last time, there were some areas of responsibility that the deputy was designated to have. The present job description is vaguer in that respect uh, and is predominantly, as you said, a support mechanism. But I'm just wondering whether, in terms of looking at possible candidates and so on, uh, you might need to have in mind, or whether you do have in mind, any particular areas of responsibility that your deputy might well be taking on. I mean, I know, for example, when, sorry to go back to old days, when you were appointed you then had a, a responsibility in regard to domestic abuse. Clearly, I think that's a personal interest now, so it's unlikely to be compared. But it would seem appropriate to me to have at least something in mind, some things in mind, where the deputy may have particular areas of responsibility, as indeed you did at that time. And, and that seems to be missing from there. The other aspect I, I would suggest, and I'm sorry to put it this way, because um, you probably didn't write it personally, but it does seem a little bit rushed in places. If you look at some of the grammar used uh, in some of them, uh, there are examples uh, that I could go through, but there is, there's some shorthand, it would appear, in some of the uh, uh, wording that is used in the uh, job description which doesn't demonstrate for me uh, the greatest efficiency, I have to say. But I'm more particularly interested in those, those specific areas that you may be looking at. Um, I can assure you it wasn't rushed. Um, we went back and forth on it a lot, didn't we? So if there's some typos or areas that we've maybe missed, then obviously we can uh, clarify that. Um, in terms of the specific areas, so, uh, so yes, when I was previously a deputy, I had a particular responsibility for victims um, because of that additional um, responsibility that had been given to PCCs. For me, I think the role of victims is very important, and that's why I'm keen to retain that as the, as the PCC. And similarly, I think in terms of the broader role, I'm the one that's ultimately accountable. I'm the one that the public have elected, and so or everything, every decision that is made within my office 
is, is my responsibility. So I'm very keen to make sure that I don't necessarily just hand something over to the deputy and say, right, that's your job now, because ultimately I am the one that's responsible for delivering it. So that's why I've left it more broad. Having said that, I am very conscious that you're absolutely right, depending on who applies and what they come in with, there might be somebody who brings a great wealth of experience with a particular area that maybe I have less in, um, and I'll be very keen to utilise that. Um, so, you know, for example, we just launched our uh, road safety strategy, strategy yesterday. If somebody comes in who maybe has got a lot of thoughts and passion around that, then it would make sense to help me to get them in to help me drive that road safety strategy. So I'm not ruling it out, and that's why I think we've left it deliberately broad so we can attract a wide range of applicants, and then that will give me the space to figure out um, who is the best candidate to do the job. And if there are particular areas that we can get to focus on, we'll absolutely do that as we go forward. I would have thought that if you're looking at potential candidates, you would need to have something in mind which says what I want the candidate to do. And I think in terms of particular areas of responsibility, that needs to be something in mind because it's not a case of saying, would that candidate suit whatever or think our thinking? But the job I need doing needs this sort of person to do it. So the job I need doing is to free up my time in terms of capacity. So I don't want to say now that it's definitely going to be somebody who's going to do you know, X subject because then there might be a brilliant candidate out there who is brilliant at a different area. And what it might mean is that then I get them to do that bit and then I'll focus on something else. I don't want to restrict myself now because there might be some brilliant candidates out there who would just be experts in a particular area that I hadn't thought of. So I suppose I just don't want to tie myself down at this stage. It is something that we'll, we'll think about and we'll try and draw out in the interview. But, you know, all of the areas within my police and crime plan are priorities, you know what I mean? They're in there for a reason. They're, they're, they're all very important issues. And the important thing here is around how I can build capacity so we can make sure that everything in the plan is, is driven forward and it's not just, you know, who is particularly interested in one area. I just want to make sure we've got capacity in the office to drive everything forward and how we kind of divvy that up and how we spread that responsibility will be based on, on who we get in to fill, fulfil that role. Okay. Thanks, Commissioner. Leah? Um, I noticed that the job is advertised um, three days a week. <laughs> and taking on board what you've said about the, the role being supportive to you, could we not look at it as some sort of um, change the job um, to a, a PA, which from what you've said is what you seem to need, and we could then reduce and have a cost saving with that? Um, it does seem um, that... Without, you're not going to, you don't know whether you're going to give this person a specific role or responsibility. And there's been a lot of talk about being supporting you. Um, so I just wondered whether that would be a way of saving money. Um, it's, I don't need a PA. I've got a fantastic PA already. Um, so that's definitely not the role. It is, um, or office manager, yes. It is, um, it, it's very much about somebody who can make decisions um, if I'm not there or somebody who I'm confident can go and represent my office um, at a community event, for example, um, or if there is uh, decisions that need to be consulted on, there is somebody who can be in that room to, to share what my perspective might be. So they will work very, very closely with me in terms of being able to represent me in those meetings. Um, so it, it is a big role. Do you know what I mean? I, I am asking them to deputise for me so they would absolutely have the ability to make decisions um, to a point there are certain things they wouldn't be able to do. So I think it is a big role. Um, and which I've deliberately tried to keep it three days, as I say, to try and manage the cost, because I'm mindful of the cost of the office. Um, but I do think it's the role that's needed, and hopefully the role description kind of outlines that. Sorry, Sue, do you want to...? Yes, thanks. Just to add to that as well, um, I think it's important that um, this individual, that the office staff uh, are actually politically restricted. Yeah. So that would also limit their abilities uh, to support the commissioner, you know, depending on the nature of, of what she was involved in. So that's why... Uh, it has to be uh, a deputy rather than just somebody within the office. Thank you, everyone. No further questions. Could I just make a comment? Um, it's to say thank you, because we have, as a panel, been wanting you to appoint a deputy. And so it's great that the process has begun. And just to echo what Sue has just said, um, this is a political soundboard as well as anything else. And I accept what you're saying, Commissioner, is that you will need to review the detail of the role 
once you have made an appointment, dependent on the experience and skills that person brings to the role. Um, and I think that's acceptable. Having said that, I think the panel are really interested in how this develops, and we will need to have somebody present as an observer on that occasion. I've been told it's either the chair or the deputy chair, um, but at this stage, we don't know about availability, but we will look into that, and if by any unforeseen chance neither of us can make it, we will certainly have a panel member, I'm sure, present f to make sure that process is fair yeah. because of the political sensitivity around it in, in particular. Are we all okay with that? Yep. Thank you. Um, so we go now to item four, which is the governance arrangements. And can we have an update, please, Commissioner? Um, yes, so I think um, the answers are all in the document. Uh, as far as I know, they're all up to date now with all the detail. Um, but yes, happy to clarify anything or follow any questions. Do we have any questions from the panel on this? No? Oh, that's a nice straightforward one. And I think at this point it's okay for you and your team to leave, Commissioner, because I think the rest is our business in-house. Thank you. And thank you all for your time today. It's been a very good meeting. Thank you. Um, the next item for us to consider is item five. David, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a regular item um, that we bring to the panel usually twice yearly. Um, this version of it in terms of monitoring um, expenditure against the, the budget that's available to support the panel. Um, reflects the actual final outturn for the 21-22 financial year. Um, you'll have seen from the report, obviously, that we've got the, um, the parameters set by the Home Office grant, which is in the sum of £64,340. Um, and you'll see from the table of 4.2 how that has been spent against um, both in, in, in both half years um, we're required to, to, to put a claim into the Home Office on a twice yearly basis. Um, but the final outcome was that there was a variance of uh, just over £2,000 um, above um, the grant figure, which, uh, as has happened in previous years, has had to be absorbed by the host authority. Um, it was a figure that was lower than the previous year, um, but I think that can be explained by the fact um, the, the demands in the previous year, 2021, um, were greater than panel net more, um, and it was the period in which there was remote meetings and the challenges that had to be supported in relation to that. Um, the panel met less in 21, 22, but I think just to make members aware that obviously um, the costs that face the host authority are subject to current events. Um, and that there is a likelihood that, that there may be a similar variance, if not a bigger variance, um, for 22-23. Um, so the information is here for the panel to um, note, but also to agree that you continue to receive twice yearly updates. So we'd intend to bring you um, a further update um, once we've got the confirmed um, first half year figure for 22-23 um, in terms of the, the, the budget monitoring. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, David. Do we have any questions around that? No. Um, therefore, do we endorse the financial outturn for the financial year 21-22? Yes. And B, do we continue to be provided with panel twice yearly, uh, updates twice yearly on this issue? Yeah, thank you. Um, 
therefore we are happy to, for it to be recorded that we endorse these actions. Item six. Um, we, do, we do not have any other items of urgent nature, so I would, unless anybody else has, I would like to close the meeting and thank you all for your attendance and see you next time, if not before. I believe there is a launch, the hope launch that yeah. Sonia mentioned. Do you know what date that is? No, I haven't got my diary with me. I mm -hmm. just know it's